Chapter Two, Part One of the Boy Scout Aviators by George Durston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kangaroo. Quick Work, Part One. At home, Harry had an early dinner with his father and mother, who were going to the theater. They lived in a comfortable house which Mr. Fleming had taken on a five-year lease when they came to England to live. It was one of a row of houses that looked very much alike, which itself was one of four sides of a square. In the center of the square was a park-like space, a garden, really. In this garden were several tennis courts, with plenty of space also for nurses and children. There are many such squares in London, they helped to make the British capital a delightful place in which to live. As he went in, Harry saw a lot of the younger men who lived in the square playing tennis. It was still broad daylight, although at home, dusk would have fallen. But this was England at the end of July and the beginning of August, and the light of day would hold until ten o'clock or thereabout. That was one of the things that had helped to reconcile Harry to living in England. He loved the long evenings, and the chance they gave to get plenty of sport and exercise after school hours. The school that he and Dick attended was not far away. They went to it each day. A great many of the boys boarded at the school, but there were plenty who, like Dick and Harry, did not. But school was over now, for the time. The summer holidays had just begun. At the table there was much talk of the war that was in the air, but Mr. Fleming did not even yet believe that the war was sure. They'll patch it up, he said confidently. They can't be so mad as to set the whole world ablaze over a little scrap like the trouble between Austria and Serbia. Would it affect your business, dear? asked Mrs. Fleming. If there really should be war, I mean? I don't think so, said he. I might have to make a flying trip home, but I'd be back. Come on, time for us to go. What are you going to do, boy? Going to over to Grenfell's, aren't you? Yes, father, said Harry. All right, get home early. Good night. A good many of the boys were already there when Dick and Harry reached Grenfell's house. The troop, the 42nd of London, was a comparatively small one, having only three patrols, but nearly all of them were present, and a scoutmaster took them out into his garden. I'm going to change the order a bit, he said gravely. I want to do some talking, and then I expect to answer questions. Boys? Germany has declared war on Russia. There are reports already of fighting on the border between France and Germany. And there seems to be an idea that the Germans are certain to strike at France through Belgium. I may not be here very long. I may have to turn over the troop to another scoutmaster. So I want to have a long talk tonight. There was a dismayed chorus. What? You are going away, sir? Why? But Harry did not join. He saw the quiet blaze in John Grenfell's eyes, and he thought he knew. I volunteered for foreign service already, Grenfell explained. I saw a little fighting in the Boer War, you know, and I may be useful, so I thought I'd get my application in directly. If I go, I'll probably go quietly and quickly and there may be no other chance for me to say good-bye. "'Then you think England will be drawn in, sir?' asked Leslie Franklin, leader of the patrol to which Dick and Harry belonged, the Royal Blues. "'I'm afraid so,' said Grenfell's grimly. "'There's just a chance still, but that's all, the ghost of a chance, you might call it. I think it might be as well if I explained a little of what's back of all this trouble.' Want to listen? If you do, I'll try. And if I'm not making myself clear, ask all the questions you like. There was a chorus of assent. Grenfell sat in the middle. 
the scouts ranged about him in a circle. In the first place, he began, this Servian business is only an excuse. I'm not defending the Servians. I'm taking no sides between Servia and Austria. Here in England, we don't care about that, because we know that if that hadn't started the war, something else would have been found. England wants peace, and it seems that every so often she has to fight for it. It was so when the Duke of Marlborough won his battles at Blenheim and Ramillies and Malplaquet. Then France was the strongest nation in Europe, and she tried to crush the others and dominate everything. If she had, she would have been strong enough, after her victories, to fight us over here, to invade England. So we went into that war, more than two hundred years ago, not because we hated France, but to make a real peace possible, and it lasted a long time. Then, after the French revolutions, there was Napoleon. Again, France, under him, was the strongest nation in Europe. He conquered Germany and Austria, Italy and Spain, the Netherlands, and he tried to conquer England so that France could rule the world. But Nelson beat his fleet at Trafalgar. Hooray! interrupted Dick, carried away. Three cheers for Nelson! Grenfell smiled as the cheers were given. Even after Trafalgar, he went on, Napoleon hoped to conquer England. He had massed a great army near Boulogne, ready to send it across the channel. And so he took the side of the weaker nations again. All Europe, led by England, rose against Napoleon. And you know what happened. He was beaten finally at Waterloo. And so there was peace again in Europe for a long time, with no one nation strong enough to dictate to all the others. But then Germany began to rise. She beat Austria, and that made her the strongest German country. Then she beat France in 1870, and that gave her her start toward being the strongest nation on the continent. And then, I believe, and so do most Englishmen, she began to be jealous of England. She wanted our colonies. She began, finally, to build a great navy. For years we have had to spend great sums of money to keep our fleet stronger than hers. And she made an alliance with Austria and Italy. Because of that, France and Russia made an alliance, too, and we had to be friendly with them. And now it looks like, to me, as if Germany thought she saw a chance to beat France and Russia. Perhaps she thinks that we won't fight, on account of the trouble in Ireland. And what we English fear is that, if she wins, she will take Belgium and Holland. Then she will be so close to our coasts, that we would never be safe. We would have to be prepared always for an invasion. So you see, it seems to me that we are facing the same sort of danger we have faced before, only this time it is Germany instead of France, that we shall have to fight if we do fight. If the Germans go through Belgium, will that mean that we shall fight? asked Leslie Franklin. Almost certainly, yes, said Grenfell, and it is through Belgium that Germany has her best chance to strike at France. So you see how serious things are. I don't want to go into all the history that is back of all this. I just want you to understand what England's interest is. If we make war, it will be a war of self-defense. Suppose you owned a house, and suppose the house next door caught fire. You would try to put out that fire, wouldn't you, to save your own house from being burned up? Well, that's England's position. If the Germans held Belgium or Holland, and they would hold both if they beat France and Russia, England would then be in just as much danger as your house would be. So if we fight, it will be to put out the German fire in the house next door. End of chapter 2 Part 1 Recording by Kangaroo